Labdien, tā tad pēc ekspertu fóruma, nu, laiks apaļā galda diskusijai par sabiedrības uzticēšanos. At the expert forum, it's time for the roundtable discussion about the trust in the state administration, the pandemics and its effect on this problem. So we have slightly less than an hour for this discussion. So, and I would like to introduce the uh, panelists, uh, Richard Kozlovski, uh, member of the 13th Saima, and uh, who is also included in uh, the Commission on Assessing the Mistakes Made During the COVID-19 Pandemics. Also, Olaf Grigus, uh, Ilmars Duritis, uh, Christina Zanberga from the Latvian Civic Alliance, and also Zana Lekstinjoja from the State Chancery. I will moderate this discussion, and if you would like to ask something or you have specific comments, uh, please let us know in chat or uh, by other means. I would like to give the floor to Richard Kozlovski, uh, since uh, we are interested in, uh, the, in the results of the Parliamentary Commission, so maybe you already have specific conclusions on the mistakes made by the government during the pandemics and who is responsible for these mistakes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the possibility to participate in this forum. Thank you to all the participants and our experts uh, who provided uh, an insight in our topic, namely as a trust in the governmental decisions. What concerns Commission, the expert uh, discussion uh, um, spoke about how the Parliament oversees governmental decisions. So Parliamentary uh, Commission is one of the ways how this uh, overseeing takes place and uh, maybe it differs from the daily overseeing that is by the regular parliamentary commission since our uh, investigative commission has specific uh, powers and our mandate is given by the parliament which has uh, taken place the title is quite long i will not uh, read it out but we are tasked with assessing the governmental actions in uh, dealing with the covid pandemics and naming the guilty political officials I, I would like to say that I cannot provide specific conclusions on behalf of the Commission because we are still working on them and they will be included in our final report as it is required by the law. This report will be prepared, but from my side I see this added value in our Commission, not only speaking about these officials, but also in assessing the uh, general action taken by the government, uh, their decisions, uh, their actions, uh, how they try to overcome the crisis so that we could include findings, uh, conclusions and recommendations in the report so that if we face the next crisis, uh, the government would not repeat the same errors. And since we are speaking about an emergency, emergency situation during which these decisions were made, as we know, the emergency situation was introduced uh, uh, in the spring of 2020, and as a Minister of Interior, who was also um, who also participated in the civic disaster law, uh, Latvia actually changed our approach to managing such situations because before that all the, uh, all the tasks were given to the state rescue, uh, firefighting and rescue service as a universal service that would have to act during any crisis situation. They were expected to react and to solve all of these matters. But this approach was changed uh, to align with uh, the approach in the um, European Union, namely giving responsibility to specific se sectors and uh, risk-based approach. As you know, we have quite many ministries and each ministry is responsible for specific sectors. 
So if we speak about this uh, ministry, then the main ministry would be the Ministry of Health, who would be responsible, who would uh, take on the main role in coordinating uh, measures to overcome the crisis. The Commission, in general, has worked for four months. We have uh, asked questions to uh, various officials about the purchasing of vaccines, uh, crisis management. We also question people uh, about the economy, about restrictions that were imposed, that the aid, uh, about the aid that was uh, paid. And we have also planned out a whole range of other actions. I'd like to share information about the emergency situation as such. Let's say maybe that what concerns our main topics, uh, public trust. As far as I understand this, we have a three tier system, experts, uh, sectorial experts in their discussions, uh, uh, develop a solution and propose the solution. And then we have a crisis management board that includes politicians, ministers, and in this body they discuss um, these proposals. And then we have the cabinet of ministers who actually formalizes these decisions and makes make their decision by adopting an official document, decision of the Cabinet of Ministers. And in this case, we speak about an emergency. Fortunately, this pandemic hasn't ended and it was not a matter of just a few months. The pandemic uh, kept going on. And if we look at the current situation, uh, and, and it is my personal opinion, I cannot speak on behalf of the Commission yet, but personally, I think that the long discussions of the experts, their conclusions, their fundings uh, were extensively discussed, uh, reviewed at the political level, and the Cabinet of Ministers, who actually formalized uh, the decision of the crisis management, uh, Council, they restarted the political discussion, and as a result, it just uh, stimulated the sense of uncertainty um, in the society. You know, there is a statement about one decision, and then it turns out that it's not going to happen. So this gives a sense of uncertainty. By this, I want to say that crisis management and emergencies require uh, the decisions to be made quickly. Of course, they have to be reasonable and, and well-grounded, but they have to be accurate. It can't just happen that if we speak about restrictions that arise from the emergency, it just cannot happen that these restrictions are discussed with a specific degree of probability and uh, eventually uh, even the decisions are not implemented fully at least. From what we heard uh, from the experts, it's clear that this cannot contribute to greater trust. Possible, I would like uh, to interfere now because I would like to give the floor to uh, Ilmar Zduritz now, uh, asking about uh, the problems that you just mentioned. You know, one decision is uh, made, then after the discussion, something else is decided. So you have been a parliamentary secretary of the Ministry of Health and also a member of uh, parliament. What is your opinion about these errors and possibility to correct them? For example, if you look at the vaccination law, like from government to the parliament, then uh, the parliament says the government is responsible. So what can we learn from this? Thank you very much for this question. Hello to everyone. And thank you for organizing such a discussion. You invited me, and I will continue what uh, we heard already and what Mr. Kozlovsky said, and I must agree that in reality, the feeling and also the situation since the beginning of the crisis is that uh, the, the way 
how we make decisions in the crisis situation that experts with their expertise and the crisis management board and operational management board and also the cabinet of ministers they don't always act uh, as they are supposed to act and in reality i have uh, also participated and listened to the discussions in the uh, governments and not even uh, in in the parliament and, and and i hear that those questions are kind of um, opened again now and started from the scratch without uh, enough uh, expertise and so it has created for us in the public and also in uh, experts who used to participate and still participate in uh, directing on those recommendations that creates uh, this misunderstanding and also deficit of trust and uh, if we talk about this large topic uh, today uh, the trust uh, public trust uh, as such i must say that this crisis very clearly shows that uh, in reality the expectations uh, of the public from politicians uh, very often are very unrealistic and in reality they cannot be implemented also about uh, restrictions and trying to limit this infection and uh, improve the situation for all of us as the members of the public we would like that at it to end as fast as possible but unfortunately this situation cannot be so easily regulated uh, from uh, the uh, public officials or politicians what i also wanted to say that uh, one aspect which destroys the trust in this period and and here i would like also to mention uh, the situation about vaccination what you said how we look uh, with uh, this uh, percentage of vaccinated people and uh, uh, there are a lot of analysis but my feeling is that we are uh, from the side of politicians we have cultivated the narrative that the vaccination process hasn't succeeded and uh, the procurements of vaccines were unsuccessful and then we had unsuccessful uh, restrictions and and then we get to the narrative about uh, the failure and uh, unsuccessful country and like mr tabun said that uh, if in a specific uh, in a specific situation that is very risky and and the game and and i understand we have a normal political uh, situation where there is a position and opposition but if the the game is uh, uh towards the goal that we ignore the health and security of the public and safety of the public and uh, uh, from the highest podiums in the country we are trying to destabilize the situation and go against reasonable decisions in the context of public health that is very dangerous and that is also reflected in the process what is the percentage uh, of vaccinated people because uh, there is this anti-vaccination movements also where there are uh, several politicians participate and this movement is very active and that is represented in the results so you think that uh, your procurement of vaccines and and the first months of the pandemic's uh, management was successful and no mistakes were made no of course not uh, uh, there were mistakes made and uh, those have to be analyzed but i would like to say similarly as mr kozlovsky said that unfortunately the political process uh, also this COVID law and this uh, duty to get max vaccinated as soon as this process uh, gets to the politicians it is very very unburdened un and uh, becomes very complicated and this good intention just um, 
uh, disappear somewhere and it is very hard to, to take a decision at the political level. So yes, of course, we had mistakes. We, we needed to be more active and uh, in making political decisions, and that is completely clear, but we are all learning from this experience. And this drifting, not a purposeful movement towards the one direction, but this drifting to one side and another is, is a very, very um, visible and uh, especially in the parliament. Yes, thank you very much. And now I would like to get a comment from Olaf Spriggs uh, from the Transparency International uh, Latvia, uh, the researcher and uh, the benefits of democracy possibility to discuss the various things. Uh, maybe this is a um, loss in this case. Here is a lot to react to from what we heard right now and also what experts said, but let's start from the most recent. That, of course, there are some limits for, for the rights to protest. Of course, there should be rights for the uh, public to organize protests. Those are important rights, but at the same time, there have to be some kind of restrictions and limitations uh, from the point of view of the spread of infection, for example, and there has to be something. Just recently, we saw those uh, protests organized by the opposition and uh, the participants were asked to hug and kiss each other. And uh, this is redundant. So there is not a legitimate argumentation why something like that should have happened in this process. And we shouldn't accept it uh, as a normal part of the political processes. But of course, so there should be place for protests and, and this is a legitimate discussion. Then also it was said that there are arguments, political arguments in the parliament, and they are very visible. It's very interesting. In the first part of the event, we were talking about uh, the research uh, when we were talking to the public, and uh, the public had an impression that in the cabinet of ministers, it is very visible that there are so those arguments, and the ministers are only in interested in their own field to be able to boast about their success, and they don't see the common benefit and this is like a secondary thing so i wouldn't um, put the stone only in the government's parliament's direction but also towards the government government i think that the situation that we have the pandemics uh, the situation is ongoing already for some time and it's not that we don't understand what's going on we have had uh, quite a time to adapt and uh, the arguments that uh, decision making has to be uh, concentrated uh, within the hands of the narrow circle of decision makers because uh, nothing can be predicted everything has to be done swiftly there should be some limits to that and also reacting to some things which were mentioned here also what uh, the parliament member, member mrs voika said about uh, honesty of the integrity of uh, um, the members of the parliament and the coalition probably she exaggerated a little bit and wasn't uh, uh, enough uh, critical because um, uh, yeah we acknowledge mistakes uh, yes that's good uh, some ministers uh, have uh, left their office uh, also in the context with procurement of vaccines there were problems and the minister responsible at that time is not uh, uh, in her office anymore and uh, also the uh, other minister uh, was publicly lying uh, to, to, to the public and, and uh, he uh, put down the mandate of the minister and turned back to the parliament. But then he was elected as a, a head of the uh, parliamentary group. And so this is another, another uh, mistrust of the public. And uh, in the context of the pandemics, uh, uh, which uh, actually 
uh, already before the pandemics, we had uh, the protests of the health workers uh, who said that, that in the regulation there was uh, enshrined uh, the notion of raising salaries and raising finances for the health sector, but it wasn't implemented. And so um, in the 2019, we had a broader discussion about this a situation that we have certain regulations and laws uh, that uh, in, in a certain sector, the finances and uh, the funding is raised, but the cabinet of ministers are not implementing it and ignoring it. I remember a quite a funny situation 2016 or 2017 during the um, uh, discussing the budget, um, the opposition was drawing the attention that the government uh, hasn't planned uh, the increase of funding for uh, the higher in education establishments and the coalition uh, actually ignored it they didn't answer to the uh, didn't answer to the questions of the opposition and uh, they uh, just abstained and uh, didn't react and that was uh, quite uh, sad and uh, the problem is still and uh, the question is uh, whether the parliament uh, has done anything and has uh, amended these laws or something because uh, uh, it doesn't uh, increase the trust uh, if uh, we see that the law says uh, one but the cabinet of ministers are ignoring it so this is one aspect and then uh, another aspect is that the civil society probably were involved in um, drafting this law and some promises were made to them and and they were quite uh, in one mind and opinion that uh, this increase of funding for, for a specific sector was needed but nothing was done so if we talk about involvement of people so um, why should we why should the public involve even if uh, something is enshrined in the law but later is not implemented so that's that's all from me. So this uh, open question could be addressed to Christine Zandberg, uh, the director of uh, Latvia Civic Alliance. So could you outline what is the experience of NGOs during the pandemics, organizing the dialogue and trying also to consider that uh, protecting the interests of the public is important even if uh, even though during the crisis it was important to take very fast decisions so what is the attitude towards the ngos most probably i will not have one answer what was the attitude because uh, the public administration um if we speak about the a level of the parliament or the cabinet of ministers um, all is um, formed by people and everyone have different attitudes of course but in general i must say that uh, we have gone in, in large circles because in the beginning the organizations had to invest quite a lot of resources to remind that there is a civic society and uh, we are ready to uh, help uh, in overcoming the crisis and so organizations uh, gave signals that they are able to uh, help with volunteers and uh, they can uh, provide uh, expertise in various areas uh, but um, unfortunately in the beginning of uh, the crisis uh, we we saw that uh, this uh, NGO sector wasn't uh, highly recognized in the public administration. So organizations had to knock on the doors uh, for se several months and say that we are prepared to participate in decision making and also in practical things. And when this uh, first uh, barrier was uh, overcome, and the trust received from the public administration then in our opinion uh, this cooperation was formed more successfully and organizations were involved in uh, strategic planning uh, working groups and i assume that also zane from the state chancellery said as a good example so those cases 
because in the beginning we noticed that in several working groups uh, the organizations uh, which represent the business interests were included and there were uh, several uh, limitations um, concerning business interests but in those discussions we lacked the organizations uh, that represent interests of sev various uh, groups of the public uh, we as an ally alliance we have um, observed the processes um, that happened outside of those strategic working groups but also in various uh, meetings of the commissions then uh, we noticed that um, if there is a there is a positive impact from the pandemic so we saw that the public administration had to become digital very fast and for uh, some part of the uh, public uh, this uh, makes uh, things more complicated to participate but many people still use uh, this opportunity that uh, meetings are remote and they are open and not only those uh, for whom it is easy to get to Riga and Riga Center and be in the cabinet of ministers, uh, not only for them it's possible to participate, but also for everyone. So from the point of view of the participation of the public, this is uh, very good. And uh, also uh, the public administration were able to swift uh, uh, their uh, activities and make uh, also these uh, activities open for the representatives of the public. But if we look at about today's topic about trust, then in the previous um, talks we heard today, there is a high emphasis on uh, um, trust uh, or, or of the trusting the decision makers during the pandemics. And, and also there was a notion that uh, this trust uh, hasn't to be measured only during the crisis because trust is created uh, through the previous experience, uh, uh, through the uh, communication with the public administration. And if there is a level of trust, uh, uh, trusting the decisions made and also various solutions to reduce uh, the spread of the pandemics, then um, all this situation we see today is just a long-term consequence, is how um, the officials uh, listen to the public. And not only uh, just um, theoretically uh, thinking that uh, you have to trust what the decision makers do, but uh, they have to show that uh, those decisions are for the benefit of the public. So from the point of view of the civic society, we see long-term consequences and we really hope that um, what we see during the crisis, when it was very important for the public to trust what was uh, decided in the parliament and also the cabinet of ministers, uh, and we hope that this is going to be a very harsh uh, lesson learned uh, for the decision makers uh, to be able to prove uh, that uh, you are worthy to be trusted. And now I would like to ask uh, Zanelek Zinirwe, who is also participating in this uh, discussion. So can you tell please uh, how the uh, cooperation between the public sector, uh, how is uh, the dialogue between the public sector and also organizations? Yes, good day. Yeah, the COVID uh, time uh, really made uh, faster the adaptation of the public administration uh, to the digital environment. So we had 100% switch to the digital environment. And now is the time when we are returning again to the on-site face-to-face uh, -face, uh, formats, but this digital is a, is a parallel option. But I must also say uh, that digital format uh, is uh, very important uh, where because uh, there are uh, more people from who are interested in a specific things can participate and express their needs and the wishes this COVID time has been a challenge for all of us and and um, 
problems and issues mentioned by all the speakers, uh, starting with the lack of communication and uh, a lack of um, explanations and the giving explanations which are more clear to people and also ending with uh, trust those are the issues we have and it's not easy for anyone to work at this time uh, at all sides this is a time when to strengthen this uh, collaboration and everything of course depends on ourselves the public administration is changing the state chancellery ideas about values uh, and their uh, concepts about values are important for everyone to work who works in the public administration and and that uh, results with uh, changes in trust uh, that the public trust the public administration more and i believe that uh, this trust is built on a daily basis so when you receive those services and uh, and if we talk about decision-making process, this is the next step. This is not uh, uh, the, for, for an ordinary person. Of course, uh, everyone is invited and welcome to participate in decision-making process, but we have to remember that this is not the basic level, uh, basic level where you operate and receive what you need. And for everyone, it is important to be able to uh, solve their issues and questions as fast as possible and to receive the solution which uh, is uh, tailored uh, for their needs and this is what we are talking about the state chancellery has uh, several things uh, which are topical we are sure together with our colleagues that we are able to change the situation which is now right now we are developing guidelines um, about cooperation with with the public and then ngos and um, uh, one thing i would like to emphasize is a feedback we've been talking about this uh, uh, that if somebody uh, gives uh, some kind of proposal they have to receive a feedback what happens to this proposal and, uh, and, and and that has to be done in a way they are understood about communication uh, the colleague Ines already spoke and what what we understood um, from the public is that uh, we lack they lack information in a clear and simple language and that is uh, very important uh, i believe also that uh, communication about covid issues if it was delivered in a way people understand that would have solved a lot of problems so we are having right now and there is also um, this uh, dissatisfaction with uh, uh, pandemics and, and things which uh, are binding for every one of us. And that was in, in short, uh, describing the situation. So at the level of contacts between uh, uh, individuals, this is one plan, but if we look about uh, starting to operate uh, the uh, legislation portal and also NGOs participate. This is also a possibility for the dialogue. As to the legislation portal, it is quite clear. Uh, I wouldn't like to state that this uh, project is close to being implemented, but uh, because it was just started, but we are very sure that this will allow people to follow what uh, is going on, participate in the decision making process, and that will definitely contribute to the transparency of the legal acts so that has been one of the main purposes of this portal since the very beginning of developing this idea. Mm people will be able to see what uh, is being prepared by each body at what moment in time they'll be able to engage and to participate 
of late, I have seen uh, what concerns uh, eagerness to, par for, to participate. I have seen several uh, situations when people have really expressed interest to participate in very particular situations. For example, uh, one of these situations is the e-car uh, solutions as at the government currently planning to support um, to, 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 to support people in buying these uh, types of vehicles. Uh, one person was interested in these matters and didn't know about the decision-making process and asked as a state chancery as well as a responsible ministry. And I tried to explain to him what are uh, what are his options to comment on uh, on whatever is planned for this law. But in this particular situation, uh, I didn't write to him a message that you know that we are going to have this project uh, at the level of cabinet of minister uh, level and at the respective uh, draft uh, cabinet regulations have been uh, notified to the minister uh, meeting so that it could be improved further. So this is like a very simple um, process so the state administration maybe should not immediately disregard these proposals, but look at them and, and try to, to step into his or her shoes. How in this particular situation, the solution maybe could work in practice. I think that is a challenge for us as a state administration, but if we tried, if we were able to step into these people's shoes, how people feel in our society if we understood that i think the trust uh, could increase would increase would significantly increase maybe you can ask this question to mr duri it is because i see that you are still active we saw mm, what is uh, the government uh, view of uh, having this dialogue what does the parliament think uh, because we have seen that NGOs uh, have been active in trying to solve the crisis, crisis also businesses. Uh, how about the interest of NGOs as civil society? Maybe how their interests are taken into account uh, during the budgetary and, uh, discussions? Here, uh, I have to say, uh, though I have experience only in this uh, mandate, before that, I have also followed what takes place in various uh, political processes. But uh, considering all of this, I think we have made a few steps forward in this regard in the parliament. For example, uh, when I work in the mandate ethics and submissions committee, I see uh, or I have seen of late uh, that we receive very many initiatives signed by citizens of course we can discuss uh, whether all of them reach the uh, initial target of course not but still it takes a discussion to the very highest level to the parliament to the committee uh, to the general assembly of the parliament and quite often uh, This also results in specific actions that the ministries uh, have to take. For example, they have to plan specific changes in, the, in cabinet regulations or specific laws. On the other hand, we also receive very many letters from people, invitations from them uh, to meet, uh, to speak about specific aspects. And of course, uh, This could, uh, this could be coordinated uh, better, more efficiently. Of course, it's easy in situations when you have specific associations as, or uh, uh, unions that when was a, a clearly formulated uh, action proposal. If, it's, if we have just an individual, it's more difficult. But as a parliamentary secretary in health matters, I think colleagues from the parliament uh, have often uh, forwarded to me various problems uh, that have been um, told to them by just simple citizens. Uh, 
I think in the 13th uh, Saima, the politicians are more interested in making this process more understandable to the society, to invite all members of the parliament to engage, to participate in building our country, in building our state. And I believe that uh, there is positive progress in this regard. I will ask uh, the question to Richard Kozlovsky asked by Olofs. To what extent the parliament uh, follows what the government does, uh, let's say, uh, in uh, correcting the mistakes uh, made uh, concerning the financing for the higher education? A short comment about what Olaf said uh, about uh, concentration of decision making in a narrow group. I understand that very well. Of course, we are not speaking about a regime like in a neighboring country. But please remember that we are now speaking about emergency situation. Of course, this pandemic has lasted for some time and we don't really have emergency situation. Uh, we have two main laws that impose specific restrictions and also speak about the financial support to the economy. But what concerns the emergency situation? We had a problem. I think uh, that the politicians maybe did not listen that much to experts, but thought that maybe they are experts, and then uh, made these discussions uh, public, and, and, and this resulted in this uncertainty in the public. If we look at the pandemics, uh, then there were some politicians who had zero understanding. And then in emergency situations, and we have to ask uh, whether we will listen to the experts or to politicians or do what experts say or politicians do uh, say. Uh, what concerns the um, wages of uh, healthcare professionals and higher education? I think it was total lack of responsibility, total carelessness. Uh, so we have laws and they are not implemented. There is no money assigned. So the law is there, but there is no money. And if we look about, if we speak about the future and the national development plan and sustainability, I think we have to agree how the financing will be allocated, whether we'll change the laws, because it's clear that the next year's budget will also be quite difficult to adopt considering the available financing. And at the end, uh, if I may, very quickly, I remember what uh, expert Tabon said about the peculiarities of the parliamentary system that uh, we will never had a hundred percent consensus because this system uh, just by its nature means that we have various groups elected as the fragmentation uh, and colleagues on Thursday discussed uh, about this. I think there is a specific line uh, when we speak about being united, uh, it's about pandemics and, and overcoming the pandemics. And here I definitely rely on science and not on politics to, to solve the crisis. And then there is a question what we do as politicians, because we, the voters, uh, listen to what we say, what they watch what we do. And if, if we see these very low numbers, it just means that we have to do everything to try to increase these trust indicators. Uh, maybe one, two or three aspects uh, that you could really try to undertake to do. Uh, I can commit uh, to what I just mentioned. We, if we speak about the pandemic period, I'm in charge of a specific committee that uh, reviews the pandemic period. My deepest conviction is that uh, I don't think that we should allow to politicize this issue. And unavoidably, this has happened. So the commitment is that when we will, when we write the final report, we will provide not only this recommendation, but other recommendations about the crisis management. 
and this is what what I intend to do, and we don't have any disagreements with the colleagues about this. So this will be a recommendation. It is clear that we cannot try to gain political capital uh, on, on, on these problems that we have uh, in our daily life, like in hospitals. Thank you. Um, this discussion is close uh, to be close uh, to its end. Uh, Mr. Duritz, what would be your um, your proposal, recommendation, so that the public would trust the decisions made by politicians? You asked me, yes? You asked this question to me, yes? My observations uh, show that, uh, that maybe we should we should try to avoid being inconsistent. We have to listen to experts, but politicians, of course, have to make these decisions. And I believe if we want to fight the pandemic, the crisis, I think is the worst. And if we look at the errors already made, I think the worst and the errors were related to a hesitation in ability to agree about further action. This has to be taken into account because if we look at these experiences also at other countries, I think the, uh, the result and the efficiency is uh, better and higher when the action uh, has been more uh, convincing, uh, clearer towards one specific goal, I think that gives us this ability to be consistent and to clearly also be able to accept unpopular decisions that unfortunately we have to accept due to pandemics and we have to accept many such decisions but as politicians of course we, we are afraid or scared of making such decisions and this is not that right christine zanberger your conclusions maybe for politicians something that you would recommend as i mentioned and there are things that we can learn from the crisis that we can improve. And one of these things is if we conclude that uh, the participation process uh, um, shows that we should um, continue in the hybrid regime of government meetings. Uh, if we want to ensure extensive participation, maybe people should be allowed to follow it electronically. Second, we should facilitate the public-private partnership, uh, and here I mean NGOs, civil society, academic, business sector, so that all these sectors could, part could cooperate and that would allow us to achieve better targets because we are not sitting uh, opposite to each other. We sit together at the same table, we, save the, we solve the same issues. Third, communication. Uh, we extensively discussed a trust, uh, decisions made, why we are uh, here, where we are, that people don't trust in um, the best decisions being made. I think communication uh, should be not only uh, spelled out in a simple human language, but this communication should be also clearly targeted because each societal group has different uh, experiences, different opinions, and so on. And we have to provide uh, customized information to them that is uh, appropriate for this particular group uh, to reduce uh, these uh, maybe opposition to the decisions, concerns, uh, doubts. I think this is what was lacking because we had just bare facts and that's it. And maybe this, there were some aggressive invitations to restrict, to vaccinate and so on. But what we lack or what we have had, uh, what we have lacked is this customized uh, human content uh, for specific groups. Uh, so if we speak about strategic communication, maybe this is what the public administration should improve. Communication as an 
potent factor was also a part and parcel of Azane Lagzdenya Yaya words. Uh, would you like to add something? Would you like to add something, uh, State Chancery? Uh, I would like to apologize. I, I did not get that it was for me. I think not what I hear colleagues, when I hear colleagues mm, telling their stories and when I see uh, mm, real situations. For example, I received a call from uh, a a company who have very specific uh, manufacturing processes like they asked what how should i tell to employees uh, what should i say uh, can vaccinated uh, people work with uh, walk around their premises without masks or they have to wear masks and so on our society is very diverse we have very diverse situations and uh, the state administration tries to reach and identify all these target groups, but they are so different. And when you try to uh, learn about these particular situations, last year, for example, I tried to solve uh, the following. You know, there is like a market area by the supermarket. And, and, and the question was whether you can sell slippers outside the store. And this is the real questions. And as the state administration, maybe we, we, this is what I do in my daily work. I try to find an answer for a very particular question that the people have. And I think this is also relevant for the state administration that concerns also communication. And I think we should spend more resources on this. Olaf's uh, Grigus also is a participant in this discussion. So Olaf, looking at the dynamics, uh, how the trust of the public uh, has changed. Uh, so in the first months of the pandemic, it was very high, but now it is uh, much, much lower. So now we are at the lowest point um, in uh, trusting the um, government. And now we are um, building steps uh, to rebuild this trust so what are the main steps we have to take so re reacting to what mr kozlovsk said uh, those laws related to the financing and amendment of uh, uh, the law and, and some already had uh, the constitutional court decisions and uh, this amendment is one uh, practical step uh, to increase uh, trust in uh, legislators. That has to be improved, but this is only part of the problem. Another part of the problem is that uh, the groups of the public who are in the sectors uh, who um, had this extra additional funding promised this uh, problem still stays there and do we still have a dialogue with this sector and uh, do we find the funding also as uh, mr kozlovsk says uh, member of the parliament uh, working in the budget commission said that that was irresponsible and uh, these uh, economic uh, possibilities uh, couldn't uh, ensure this uh, extra funding and yes in some conditions it is like that but in some not because uh, here we say see that these external limitations uh, for uh, the debt of the country is lifted uh, and so the situation has changed and also during the recent weeks uh, Re Baltica uh, research uh, investigative journalists uh, uh, questions a fiscally disciplinary uh, council and they heard that uh, the representatives of this commission say that Latvia can borrow and the concern is whether there will be a meaningful investments but the government says that it's not possible to find finances and this is a top, totally different answer totally different idea and we have to speak honestly if it is possible to find this funding and you are not sure uh, whether you will be able to invest it reasonably uh, then you must uh, say it openly and uh, discuss it with the sector and you shouldn't be lying also at the eu level there was a meeting uh, um, for the ministers of finance and so far i saw that the position of latvia was that uh, uh, we would like to 
limit uh, our spending and uh, and 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 then uh, there is a question so if latvia has so many needs so why our position in uh, this uh, european level is that we don't uh, need uh, some extra money and we would limit it so we need to think about it for the future uh, thank you very much and we will also try to understand uh, we are concluding the discussion and also the expert forum. So, uh, Ines Voika, do you have anything else to add? Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you very much for this discussion. I believe we need to find the balance and uh, uh, the, the, the best way between uh, the common need and personal need. And um, I was impacted uh, by what uh, representative was the state chancellor. He said that she's trying to solve individually each problem and to find the best way. So we need to strengthen uh, the human resources uh, within the public administration so uh, so it's possible because uh, here this uh, mistrust grows if if you don't get a good uh, attitude from the officials because you cannot solve your own issues you need to write to the parliament and to the president uh, to draw attention to you or you have ideas or complaints and and you cannot uh, do something so from my side i am want to say that um, in uh, the parliament uh, we will improve one of the deficiencies and uh, this is a lack of uh, lobbying legislation so together with all the groups of parliament and experts uh, and also organizers of this discussion down we have uh, developed and drafted the transparency regulation which will allow to lobby and to represent the interests and and it will give more balanced approach uh, to impact uh, uh, the decisions not only uh, that uh, those who have more money can impact. And of course, uh, this uh, draft law has to go through the legislative process in our parliament. And I hope um, that we will use also the uh, conclusions from today's discussions and more openness and uh, uh, fulfilling promises and strengthening responsibility through openness is also one of the notions which uh, promote trust and I believe that Dalna and others will continue discussions because uh, trust has a lot of aspects, uh, ethical and professional, and uh, we are ready to participate in such discussions and also think what we can change and improve. Thank you. Thank you very much to Ines Savoyka for her conclusion. So respectful communication, involvement of the broad public and also maintaining the remote uh, working groups platforms uh, and thus uh, promote trust and also building the country together. Thank you to all the participants of the discussion. Goodbye.